Welcome to the Tales to Inspire podcast. Before we get started on this episode, I would like to invite you to our community so that you can hear more stories to inspire change within your life and positive change within the systems in which we live. All I want you to do is to click on the subscribe button. Your comments mean the world to us with anything that's resonated with you and I absolutely love your support. I can't wait to go on this journey alongside you. Thank you so much for subscribing. Let's get in to today's episode. Who are you, where you're from, and let's go from there. All right, cool. So yeah, I'm Emma, Emma Marshall, uh, and I'm the founder and creator of Movement is Medicine UK. And so Movement is Medicine UK is all about, yeah, dance, music, but specifically meditation. And when we think about meditation, we think stillness, and it's not still. Everything that we do is a form of movement. And so what we're trying to teach people is that, you know, these classic kind of things that people are searching for, when it comes to well-being and it comes to their mental health and their physical health, it's kind of all broken up into these individualistic categories. And we're trying to be like, no, 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 you can just do all this stuff in your daily life. Like it's all very applicable and it doesn't also have to be still and quiet. It can be loud and moving. And given the society that we live in, that's what I think people want. They want this stimulation. So there's nothing wrong with stimulation when it's done in the right capacity. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we do at Movement is Medicine is we teach people this methodology that is based on neuroscience, dance and music and combine them all. Um, we really put in a lot of stuff that's to do with rave culture. Rave culture is a massive part of my life. Um, so I worked in the music industry for about 10 years. I grew up as a raver in London, like around drum and bass and garage and grime and funky and like all these genres and was just going out all the time and fell in love with it and that was like my happy place. And so when I got to university and it was like having to figure out what I wanted to do, I was doing some like music journalism, re like reviewing parties and reviewing raves. Um, I was flyering for drum and bass nights. I was just like kind of immersing myself. And one of the things that like now obviously upon reflection, I can be like, oh, I was networking. But like, I didn't think of it like that. I was just out and I just got to know people. So yeah, when I came out of university, I worked with kids for a little bit. I was a teaching assistant, so I worked with SEN uh, kids and decided that teaching wasn't for me. And so my mum was like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I'm working in the music industry. And she was like, what, what, doing what? I was like, I don't know. Because you don't get told what that is. You just know that people work in music, right? So I was like, I don't know. But by that point, I had enough contacts. So I messaged one of my friends and just said to him, like, I really want to get into this. And he was like, oh, we're running a festival. Do you want to come and work at that? So I did. Worked at that festival, met a guy, got a job at a booking agency and then that was it. That was kind of the start of my career and then I just took on more and more and more work. But what I didn't understand or didn't even have the education of was burnout. I had no concept of burnout. I had no concept of like how that, how your lifestyle can really affect you if you're not taking care of yourself. We're just kind of taught like go, go, go. So I um, really did burn out. I started getting physical symptoms. I was very anxious. My hair was falling out. My skin was breaking out. I was very tired. I had like joint pain. So like anyone, I went to the doctor and they were like, you're fine. It's all good. And I was like, I'm not fine, but okay. And then about four months later, my, I got really serious health problems. It went from like a bit into like serious. So I was hospitalized with like a really serious kidney infection and I had to have a catheter. And then after that, I wasn't barely recovered from that and I was quite weak. And so I got tripped over in the street and I fractured my wrist. And I've broken bones before because I used to play football when I was younger. So it's like, well, it is what it is. Um, but after like three days, the pain got worse and worse and worse. I was like, this isn't normal. So I went back and then I went on this unfortunate journey with the NHS where they were just like, we don't know. And I was like in agony and I was put on a lot of tramadol and other opioids. And it just was so painful. I couldn't explain what it was, but it was just this pain that was radiating all up my arm and down into my left side of my body. I couldn't move. I had to move back to my mum and dad's. I had to... Um, yeah, be cared for basically. And eventually I was diagnosed with something called uh, CRPS, which is a nervous system disease um, where happens a lot for people that have been in the military. There's a link between trauma and the nervous system in relation to pain um, within this specific disease. It's basically, they think that your pain receptors get crossed during the trauma. So the trauma for me was the fall, um, the injury itself. So my pain receptors were just going crazy, just like, you're in danger, like all the time. So it was just this burning, stabbing, couldn't move my hand. Anytime I moved it, it was just like, 
yeah, agony. And just for context, it's like above childbirth and amputation of like certain limbs on the pain chart. It's like one of the most painful conditions that exists. Um, and there's not a lot of research, especially not like back then either. When was this? This was 2015. So yeah, like eight years ago now. Um, there's a bit more now, or at least I, I mean, the internet and social media has helped with all of this. Um, there's even a documentary about this on Netflix at the minute of a girl, it's called Take Care of Maya. She had this disease and it's her story and it's really awful. But yeah, more stories are coming out now of people that are going through these kind of things. So that all happened. And then I, I was still going through that. It was kind of getting a little bit better, but I was still going through it. And then I one day woke up with like severe abdominal pain went back into hospital and then they were like oh you've got appendicitis and so they took my appendix out and then when I came out of surgery they were like well it wasn't really just your appendix you just got all this crazy inflammation in your in your gut and we don't know why um and we're going to refer you to a gastroenterologist and I just sort of at that point just went just don't bother because I'm like you none of this is all crazy to me like I'm 25 I'm meant to be like healthy given my blood test that you're doing why is my body just collapsing 24 7 I've been in and out of hospital now for six months like with different things and they're not just like oh I had the flu like this is like serious illnesses um so yeah I remember going to the doctor the doctor was like oh I think you're depressed I was like yeah of course I'm depressed because this was horrible <laughs> like it's the depression related to what I've just been through and I just kind of lost a lot of trust within that system so I took it into my own hands I started studying like nutrition and herbs and supplements and just lifestyle I, I changed my lifestyle completely changed my diet stopped drinking alcohol like got a new job where I had like specific boundaries within my working hours still in the music industry but just in a different kind of space um and yeah like slowly recovered but didn't ever quite make a full recovery because I didn't really know what was wrong I didn't ever have the thing that was like this is the thing so I would say that I was still I was like healthy-ish but I was still quite weak like that was probably the best way to explain it I'd still get like the flu quite a lot and you know that kind of thing my immune system wasn't great and I'd always like kind of if I felt my lifestyle was getting on top it would just be like oh crash so um yeah I got to 2018 and I had to have an operation that was like I had to have it it was um it was very important that I had it and unfortunately it went wrong and so I ended up um, having a very traumatic incident with, with that. And they put me on sepsis medication. And then there was this whole thing afterwards that it just went on and on and on. The recovery period was ages and it really affected my, me mentally. And so it got to like, uh, this is in 2018. So it got to 2018, October time. And this had all happened in June. And I was just, I wasn't all right at all. I was really, really, really not all right. Uh, like really low, like suicidal actually, and just losing it. Cause I just didn't know what was wrong. I kept going back into hospital. Like there's something wrong with me, like physically and mentally, like I'm really not okay. And they just kept me like, we don't know. And so I was diagnosed with PTSD. So I started having like therapy for that. Um, and mentally it was kind of clear what was going on. But it was like, well, you've been for a lot, so it makes sense. But um, physically, I just kept getting sicker. Um, and by this point, I had probably about 30 symptoms, like just throughout my body of just things just kept getting worse, losing crazy amounts of weight. Hair was really falling out. Um, yeah, just really not well. And then I went to functional medicine. So functional medicine is doctors that they are doctors, but they've kind of looked at more natural approaches to health and holistic approaches to health. And there was this kind of, I felt like it was now on reflection, a bit more of like an obsession with things like black mold and Lyme disease and toxins and all these things. And that was kind of that whole community. They're like, it's one of those. And I was like, right, okay, well, did the test. Lyme disease was negative, but I had all these uh, markers for black mold poisoning um, that was in my house. And I was like, okay, so I've been poisoned. That's what the aunt, that's what's going on. So I had to raise all this money and then go to Mexico. And I was in hospital in Mexico and they were like, well, you do have like, these markers, but actually your immune system is the problem. Like you've got this like suppression within your immune system, but there's no reason for it. Like we, as in, we can't see what that is. I later found out that it was stress. <laughs> it's, the long, it's the simplest way to put it. There was this, 
there's these cells in your immune system called your NK cells. And your NK cells are specifically for viruses, bacteria, tumors like cancer, etc. And a healthy individual has like 300 plus. Mine were at six. Like I just wasn't fighting off anything. So they found out I had these like, infections in my lungs and in my joints. And I was just really poorly at this point. I just wasn't fighting anything. And my endocrine system was affected. My nervous system was affected. My gut was affected. Um, so I had all this very intense treatment that left me not able to walk. And like I was having seizures, um, like crazy treatments where they were like taking my blood out and putting oxygen into it and then putting it back in. So the oxygen would try and essentially do its job to reboot my immune system, um, put me to sleep um, under general anesthetic and then heated my body up to like 108 degrees to essentially try and um, recreate a, a temperature. So the opposite of hypothermia is hyperthermia. So that's what it's called. And had that done a few times. And it's just like it's really intense treatment. And I left that hospital thinking like you go into hospital and you go have treatment and then you come out and you're like, okay, I'm done. And it was like, nah, there's, you're not done. Like you're not well. Um, but it took me a long time to accept that. Like I was going to be on this for a little while. So I ended up staying in Mexico um, and I at this point went to start working with like shamans and like plant medicines and just trying to learn like what was going on and it was just very intense and then came back to the UK it was still on this like crazy treatment but it was more not I was off antibiotics at this point it was more like herbs and supplements and that kind of thing but it was like herbs every hour on the hour and with medicines right if they're herbal or they're um, pharmaceutical it, they're the same effect like they're really, really strong. So herbs, it was like, they're these crazy intense herbs that tasted disgusting. And I was taking these drops every hour and it was just making me worse and worse and worse. And it finally got to a point after a year of this where I was like, I can't actually do this anymore. This isn't making me better. Like, what's the point? This is a waste of time. So I started looking at other stuff. And then I met this woman who was a homeopath and she just started to say to me, she was like, you know, your mind and your body are connected and your nervous system is the key to that. And so we start, I, she just kind of switched something on. I was like, oh, okay. So I went down that route and I just did all this research into neuroscience, into the nervous system, into trauma. And I'm looking at this, you know, this research in front of me that's like, oh, okay, cool. This is what happens when your body's under stress. This is what happens when your body's under chronic stress and traumatic stress. And these are the responses. And this is how it affects your endocrine and your, and your immune system. And all these different things started to go click. I was like, all right, cool. I'm traumatized. Like my body's just in a trauma response. And that's why I can't heal. So I can't get better. So... Um, yeah, just did crazy amounts of work on having to regulate my nervous system and also at the same time try and get back on my feet. By this point, we're at the pandemic. There's no resources. There's no help available. So I'm like, yeah, I'm still on my own. Like That's how I felt the whole time anyway. So I'm still on my own, but now it's like the world is shut down. And to me, it was actually a bit of a blessing. For a lot of people, obviously not. But for me, I was a bit like, oh, like I can still live in this weird bubble um, of just figuring it out. And were you in the UK or were you in I was in the UK at this point, okay. yeah, back in London. So at this point, I one day woke up and I still was getting like crazy pain in my legs and just like tired all the time. My skin was covered in acne, my hair wasn't good and just visually I didn't look well still. And I just woke up one day and it was like, you've got to move. If you don't start to move, you will never get better. And that was this like, it was just, I can't explain it other than intuition. It was just a message that was just so clear. And I was like, okay, well, I can't go to the gym. I can't do this, I can't do that. And I was like, I'm just gonna start to dance. So that's what I did. I just started putting music on that I used to go out to, artists, DJs that I used to listen to, sets. And I used to just dance in my flat. And that's kind of where it all came from. That's the origins of it. It was never like a taught thing at that point. It was just me doing it for me and then applying all the neuroscience to it. And then got to the end of 2020 and I was a bit like, I don't think that me being around pandemic kind of era, um, even just like people's, that the fear of people around this illness and everything that's going on, I can't recover like this. Like I've already been in this. So I actually ended up moving back to Mexico because Mexico was just a lot more open. They weren't as sort of... Yeah. So, yeah, I moved back to Mexico and then I took it upon myself when I was there. I was like, I'm going to learn. I'm going to study everything that I need to study about how 
indigenous communities use dance and music, basically. And more than that as well, just their approach to healing, really, and movement, and just the things that we don't understand. Which goes to the we, doctors yeah. for and yeah, health. exactly. So I started to learn from people and like went to ceremonies and sat and listened and understood and looked at dance and music from all these different angles. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like, you know, we do it, but ours is unfortunately covered with hedonism. And that's how it's ingrained into us. It's like, if you want to go out and just shake it all out at a rave, I'm not talking like club culture, where your sort of alcohol is the premise and it's table culture and all that kind of thing. I'm talking you go to like warehouse projects. Like you're going to see a DJ, like play music and just dance. And that culture is masked, unfortunately, with hedonistic tendencies. And so where you remove the hedonism, I'm like, that's what we do. We do the same thing that these indigenous communities do. When there's somebody that's going through something in like Africa, for example, where this kind of work absolutely originates, it's like they will bang drums and play drums and chant and pray and then light a fire and get people to literally shake it out, like shake their bodies and just let the body kind of go into this ecstatic movement, right? And I'm like, that's literally what we do at raves. Like we do the same thing because no one cares what they look like. They're there just like, hey. <laughs> so because I come from that world and I'd been around it and I'd seen it, I was like, yeah, this is, this is the same thing. So when I put together the methodology, at first it was like complete trial and error. It was a bit of a social experiment. It was like, right, how is this going to work? Because I'm essentially teaching people how to move, but without telling them how to move. So how does this work? And then that's how I kind of had to put it all together and get to this point of realization that the guidance that's required is just, it, that's all it is, it's just guidance. There's nothing else to it apart from go from this bit to this bit to this bit to this bit. The thing that makes it different to anything else that exists is because I put all the science in. So a lot of the time, you know, even if you do like a PT course, you don't necessarily stand there and your PT is like, right, we're going to work this muscle. And because of the science of this, this and this, this, they don't really do that. They're just like, do five reps. So I just was like, well, let's make this an educational platform as well. Let's actually do something here that people are going to go away with these tools that they can then also use on themselves and in their daily life. They know why it works. They know what this bit means because of the science behind it. So that's kind of where the methodology is different from anything else. Um, and then over time, it grew and it built and it changed as, a, as with everything. And it got to a point at the start of last year where I stopped doing everything else that I was doing. And I was like, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take a risk and just put everything into this. And it, like, I'm talking started at zero, like, you know, cause when I was ill, I was on benefits. Like I lost everything. I lost my whole career, I lost all my money, that all the money went on treatment. You know, like I've, I've started at zero. There was no investor, there was no boardroom, there was no partner, there was no nothing. So where I'd like kind of been surviving, it was like, oh, this is a big risk because you don't actually have anything else or anyone else to fall back on. But I was like, I believe in this so much. Like, I know it works and it, it worked on me. Is it's Yeah, I'm my living experiment. And now I've taught it to enough people to be confident that it can work on others, but I'm gonna have to get people to trust me. So when I first started it, it was free. It was like a donation based thing only. Um, I, I didn't earn any money. Like I was just scrambling around. I took out loans. I, I had to, at one point, my, my best friend had to um, buy me like food shops. Like it was really, yeah, it was a lot. And, but I was so set on this thing, on this whole project. I was like, I know where this is meant to go and I know how to, put it back, not into wellness. I don't believe this is for wellness. I don't particularly like wellness as an industry. Um, this is just lifestyle. And like, how do I make that happen? How do I put it back into like, yeah, if we're gonna talk about fitness, then maybe fitness because people can kind of resonate with that and understand like, when you go into a dance class, they're getting something much deeper than a dance class, right? And so, yeah, how do I then apply that to that, the music industry? Okay, cool, well, we have to get the right sound and the right music and the right DJs. And so I just merged all of this stuff where, you know, when I was younger, as I mentioned, like I was a footballer, I was an athlete for many, many, many years. I've got coaching badges, you know, I used to coach kids. So I had that element to my, my career, even from like 13. And then I had the music industry stuff. And then, then obviously everything that happened to me, and I'm just like, yeah, it's all kind of just, just merged. It's like all of, every, all of my experiences have just merged. So now it's at a point 
where I'm really happy with it now. Like before I was like, still not right. It doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. And now I'm like, no, it, it's right now. Like we have this big rebrand, the look of it, the messaging, like we're putting it back into nightclubs, but in the day. So that's where people can come and do this like fitness class, but it is like a rave, you know, with the same kind of music, DJ, whatever. And it's really taking form now where the vision is becoming bigger and bigger and people are becoming much more interested. They're not having to kind of convince, I'm not having to convince as many people like at all. It's kind of in that zone of tell a friend to tell a friend that's really working for us. Um, and that's how we've built the trust. So instead of just doing these like paid ads and we've done none of that, it's just been all based on word of mouth. So the build of it has been obviously me and my story of being like, this works because of this reason. But then we've got all these other case studies now, which is really, really amazing. And I'm not gonna lie, like it's been hard. Like it's been really, really difficult to make this work, but it's like any time there's another hurdle, it's just like, you nearly died, you're fine. Yeah. You and know. you've got the process. The it's hurdle the process. comes, you know the process, it's you've the done process. it before and you yeah. go over it again. Exactly. So when, where were you at, so t to this day, mm. when did you start uh, Movement with Medicine and like, where are you at? Like, how long has this taken to get to where you're at now? So the study of everything was, I mean, it's still study all the time. Yeah. Everything's changing all the time. But um, the initial first sort of bit of it was like two years worth of research. Um, and then applying the research started last year. But it kind of started before that because I was doing it like one-to-one -one with people. I used to work one-to-one -one with people. Um, like, I'm, like essentially, I was, it was more like a teaching mentorship thing where people would come, I'd work one-to-one -one with them, and I'd teach them these tools and be like, this is your nervous system, this is how this works, and they go away and do it, and we'd do that for nine weeks or whatever, and they'd be like, oh my gosh, I feel completely different. I'm like, yeah, it, it works. So it went from like a one-to-one -one thing into actually being a class because at first I was like you know it's amazing that I'm working with these people one-to-one -one, but that's very unaccessible for a lot of people I am somebody that was on benefits that had nothing so I need to make sure that people can access this it doesn't matter what you're going through like where you're from you know I still have people messaging me today where they'll message me and say like oh I'm going through this I don't have money and I'm like yeah cool here's a code like it's fine like it's not meant to be inaccessible. And with the one-to-one -one work, it's like, well, that pays my bills. It kind of has to be, I can't put all this work into one person and not get paid for that sort of situation. But with the classes and the brand build, it's a different story. We can help more people in that way. Um, and also just get them to come and try it more to the point. So yeah, the, the kind of process with it as a business build, it was like two years solid of research. And then up until now, it's like two years of application with the method where it's at like of me getting to the point where i'm like yeah i'm happy with it i'm doing this full time like i'm sacking off everything else so yeah two not even two years 18 months of from there to there and in that time yeah lots happened like a lot of really good stuff has happened which has been such a blessing like that early on because that's always what we kind of get feedback wise it's like you've only just started <laughs> and you've already done, you know, TED talk and you've done TV and you've done uh, like all this other press and all these kind of things that have been so great and helpful because people are really supportive um, and they really love this because it is fun. And this is the thing. I went on a healing journey that was not fun. It was horrible. And I was talking to somebody about this the other day. There's this guy, Joseph Campbell, who talks about the hero's journey. And so the hero's journey is like at one point in any hero, like it's the application where even in movies, right? So it's like Harry Potter, that's the hero's journey or like Lord of the Rings. You go into the cave to fight the dragon, right? And my cave was horrible. It was suffering, it was pain. My body nearly gave up, like, you know, I nearly died. It was very serious. I don't want to have anyone else have to go through that. Why should they? I've been through it. I did it, so why not let me have taken that kind of L and then I can be the person that's like, well, I've got these tools, you know, this is what I found, this is what I've used. And they work and they help. And, you know, I have made a full recovery, like I'm completely healthy. And I'm probably the healthiest out of everyone I know. Like my, <laughs> my brother's always ill, like I'm fine. That We've completely swapped roles. So this is the thing now, it's like I'm in a space of, genuine health for the first time in my life based on what it is that I've taught myself. And like when I feel the aches and the pains and the tension, I don't ignore it. I'm like, right, you, you're stressed. 
your body is telling you you're stressed, you've got to do this, this or this. So these are the kind of things for me now, like everything has changed, lifestyle, but also in business to allow me to get everything to this point and then continue to grow it. Like, you know, for me next is like brand partnerships. It's putting it into like corporate spaces. It's like doing bigger events so that the brand becomes bigger. Um, and so people know our name. That is it. It's like, I want to be able to walk into a space and be like, oh, we, you know, I've found a movement is medicine. Because, oh, I know that. Even if they've never come, it's like, cool, you know what it is. That's what that matters. Because that mantra itself is like a very powerful one. It's like, even if you never come to what we're doing, just move, like, please. <laughs> like, it's so important. So, yeah. I feel like we should have put some music on in the background. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, oh, damn it, we should all be jiggling about. Have a little, have a little dance, yeah. Um, so, a few things there. Um, if, if someone was to come to you right now mm -hmm. and they said, you know, I want to know what you do, like, what is it that you offer? So, you've got the, the mentoring? No. So, what have you got? So what we do is, is now I'm the founder of this brand, of this company. That is what, I don't work with anyone one-to-one -one at all. Okay. But what I do do is I do workshops, I do panels, I do talks. So I do it in schools, I do it in businesses. Um, obviously we teach movement is medicine as a class. So not only I teach that, but I've also trained up um, on like 30 something people now who teach the method all over the UK and also abroad, which is great. So they incorporate that into their own work. So maybe they're coaches or yoga teachers or nurses or that kind of thing. Um, but also there's just people that are coming to us constantly just like, right, how can we be involved in this? How can we you know, put this into gyms? And that's the kind of thing I'm getting this. I want to get this to a point where I've got you know, a whole army of people that we're in David Lloyd and we're in all these other other places and it's not, I can't be everywhere. That was the thing. When we first started it and we were getting a request like, oh, come to Ireland and come up to Newcastle and come here. It's like, I can't, like I actually can't, but the demand is there. So how do I therefore obviously accommodate the demand for people wanting to try this, not just online, but in person. So I've trained up all these people. Now we do online classes. So you do them on Zoom, be anywhere in the world. So I teach twice a week still, um, but I've got people that teach, you know, we pretty much every day of the week. Um, it's all on the website. Um, and then we are also doing pop-ups um, in London at the moment. So next year that's gonna be like a regular thing, as I said, in this kind of nightclub space. Um, so yeah, like the last one we had like over 400 people come to that. Um, and yeah, we're just getting people through the door because it's honestly like once you've tried it, the people are like, I love it because it is fun. Like that's the key. Like I think that, yeah, you don't think that things that can be like good for you are like that fun. And this is the opposite of that. It's like, this is so good for you. And it really is really fun. Who are you finding uh, coming on? Is it is it women? Is it males? Is it young people, old people? Like who's, who's doing these things? Um, so... I think because I'm a woman, I attract more women. I want more men. So yeah, men, come. <laughs> <laughs> There's the plug. Yeah, men. Right, there you go. Come on. <laughs> we need you. Right, so so yeah, um, we need definitely more men to come, come through. I think that, again, this is why I want to remove it from the wellness space. Wellness is, I think, very heavily a female dominated area. And that's a problem. Like, where's the men's wellness? <laughs> like, what's going on? The men's wellness can't just be ice baths. Like, do you know what I mean? It, there's more to it. So, um, yeah, with it, whereas in fitness, you kind of class it as fitness. Men are like, oh, yeah, I'll come to that. That's yeah. fun. So we are getting more men now, uh, which is good, but that's definitely still a, a work in progress. So um, mainly women, but all ages. Like, I'm talking kids from, like, three up to 60, 70-year-old women. Yeah, 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 yeah. People bring their kids all the time. So even at the, um, the the nightclub venue, we had it at 10 plus because it's still a nightclub. Do you know what I mean? I kind of have babies in there, but and it's too loud for their ears. But yeah, I had it's kids in there like 10 years old, 11 years old. So that was nice um, to be able to have mums come. In fact, one of the mums that came, I went to school with her. So it was so, I used to go raving with her when we were kids. So it was like, oh my gosh, this is so funny. Oh, so cool. Yeah, so full, like full circle. So um, that's kind of at the moment, it's very, very wired and very diverse. But our main core audience is probably like between like 21 to 40, um, like of who's really, really invested in this, who wants to train in it even. You know, it's really surprising to me, like who comes through into the teacher training interviews because yeah, we've got like young, very young people who are just kind of, I don't know what I'm doing in my life. And then you've got older people who are like, I've had this career and like, I'm not fulfilled or whatever it is. And I want to do this as well. 
Um, so it's a real mixture of people that are coming. And what do they get? Do they when they when they've gone through their training? Mm. Do they get a certificate or a? a yeah, yeah. Like, what, what so is it? I work with a neuroscientist. So I've got a neuroscientist that like backs and has kind of like certified my method basically. She's like, yep, it's all good. <laughs> You're not talking rubbish. Um, so yeah, they get a certificate, just sort of saying like they're kind of certified under us. We don't. The red tape is crazy. Yeah. So it's crazy. And one day, you know, it will get to a point. I hope where things are either taken a bit more seriously or it's a bit easier to get things like fully accredited by X, Y, and Z. But it's like, well, I know that I'm sitting on something that's really special and really great. I'm just gonna crack on and do it. And it is what it is for now. So everything is done in house. Um, and so they're then free to use the method. They've got all the teachings, all the training, they get PDF. Um, of like all of the resources that we use, like 50 page booklet basically. Um, and the methodology itself, of course, they also get like a bank of music. So for me, this is the key, right? Music is so subjective, right? But, and I'm very eclectic in my music taste. I have worked with so many different genres now on this. Again, it was like trial and error, I had to see what worked to see, to know what worked. I've now got the formula in terms of like musically, what BPMs work, what kind of tracks work, what kind of genres work, how to get the best of people moving in like the, the, the best way possible going from kind of slow rhythmic movement into like very fast kind of shaking because you have to have both components. We play basically like reggae and like bashman and drum and bass and house and it's just this kind of eclectic sound but everything that we play is all about the percussion. Everything's got percussion. So you wouldn't ever hear like a Taylor Swift song or anything like that, it's not like that. It's like everything is super rhythmic. Um, so I do that. that, that's the big part for me because otherwise I think that it just kind of again falls into like, oh, well, there's another thing like that. No one is doing what we're doing because the type of music we play is so like, yeah, it's so specific. So every month I curate the playlist. I have my students, we've got a channel that we work with um, where they send me music suggestions. So I'm like, okay, cool, let me listen to all of this. And then if, it's, if it works, I'll put it in. If it doesn't, I'll just I'll leave it out. Um, but they get like a bank of like four to five hours worth of music every month um, so that they can work with that obviously personally, but also in their classes. And we're building out that at the moment as like the movement is medicine sound because that for me, like our tagline with it is like music that makes you want to move, right? It's as simple as that. You hear the percussion, it makes you want to have a little, <laughs> have a little dance. So moving forward with the brand, it's like I want to be able to go to like a festival and say, we're going to curate your stage, like give me a budget and then we'll cur curate the stage under the movement is medicine. So we have like resident DJs, we work with um, a collective called Free Yard. Um, so they were actually Manchester born, uh, uh, but London bred, yeah. And, um, so they were born here, but really they made their name down south. Down south, yeah. <laughs> and, so uh, Manchester's got no credit on that. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they, did, they did well up here, but um, he's from London. He was just up here for uni. Wow. And so like he built, he built it up here, but he's now back down south. And yeah, they've got this really nice collective of like young creatives that just musically, they're super talented. Like I think that we're in a, in a space and time with like DJ, everyone's a DJ, like everyone, right? But not everyone knows how to play. They just don't. They can do the buttons and do everything else. They don't know how to DJ. And I'm, I think that I'm a bit of a snob probably when it comes to that, because I've been around like some of the best DJs in the world, like not even just the UK. Like I used to work with some of the best DJs in the world um, from all genres. So I think that seeing and hearing now these these artists and these people coming through, these younger people who are playing bangers and they're reading the room and they're like, they get what makes people want to actually move, like properly move, not just like, oh, this is nice, you know. They are the perfect collective to work with. So we're working with them on a resident um, basis. And then once we build kind of from that, what I want to take it into is having special guests and having headline DJs come through. And then it's like, imagine going to a fitness class and like, and and you do the fitness bit and you do the, the meditation bit and then suddenly it's just like, oh look, chase and status. Like, that's what I want to get it to. It's like, we're having these headline DJs that you would hear at big festivals and whatever, but they're coming and doing these fitness classes in a, in a, in a nightclub in the day. Man, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Now there's a few things that I really want to go into, which mm. is really special, because you're not just making a product, you're making a market. So the market that you've got is, doesn't exist before you've really, and especially bringing the science into it. No. So one of the tough things, especially with the red tape, is 
you're going in, you're creating a whole new thing. Yeah. So when you take a perspective, actually, you're going way beyond any of that. Yeah. So first and foremost, that is amazing. Thank okay, you. Yeah. <laughs> to create a market and now you're creating a product within that market yeah, yeah, is yeah. just so cool. And you're going to get loads of people doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's That shows it's successful, right? Yeah. That's the brill part of it. There's something within storytelling that we do. It's called the triple H. Mm -hmm. So head, heart, and hands. Mm. So how do you connect to someone's head? How do you connect to someone's heart? And how do you connect to their hands, which is action? So head, you've nailed it here with science, mm. right? Because so many people, oh, I need proof. I need yeah. the scientific data. I'm, 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 I'm a heart's person. Yeah. I just need to feel right. Yeah. If it feels right, I'm doing it, yeah. right? So a lot of people, a third of the people connect with heart. Mm -hmm. a third of the people connect with head. And then hands. What's doing. the action? What's yeah. the doing? Exactly. And you've nailed that bit. Yeah. Well. So you've got, you've nailed all the three H's and you're like, yes. right, we are in there. But the thing that people don't do is they don't have the head often. Mm -hmm. They don't have that data. They don't have the back no. data and the science. And you've got that. The thing is, when I was building all this, I'm the same as you. I'm like, does it make me feel good? All right, cool, done. But where I was having to research because as, as, as I mentioned earlier like I didn't make a full recovery and I wanted to know why like I had to figure it out like why did I never really recover and so when I was going into all of this data and looking at everything and understanding the connections between mind and body and, and all the rest of it and then went and studied with the indigenous people I'm like you lot don't care about that stuff and I don't care that's why I'm here but to get somebody that's not me to come and sit here is impossible. But to get somebody to come and do the research is also impossible because people are lazy. Yeah. I'm going to be really real with it. They're so lazy. We're so in this age of just like immediate like gratification and, and uh, scrolling. And if you don't get the information within five seconds, you just switch off. That's dangerous. We're losing critical thinking and we're losing the ability to research. So with that in mind, I was like, well, I'm going to do it for you then because then there's no excuse. There's no excuse. I will have everything that you, you can't argue with me because this is the other thing. The internet is the Wild West. And as soon as you start saying something and so, like, oh, this is just fake. This is quackery. This is this. And I'm like, it's science. <laughs> yeah, they, they can't say anything. And you know, it's at that point now where I had, but I had to go through that. I had to go through the trolling and the, you know, the people trying to say X, Y, and Z. And even when I first started it, like I'm a massive believer in energy, like massive. I believe in everything is energy, you know, we are balls of energy. And when I teach this, uh, part of my teaching is that medical journals agree with that statement. So medical journals, when you teach about the nervous system, it states that there are electrical impulses that move through our nervous system and it's through the synapse and they go from one thing to the other thing and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, what's electricity? It's energy. So when I tell people, when I break it down like that, they're like, oh God, yeah. But if you start using, oh, well, this is energy, people just switch off. So it, it's all, it, you just have to be very clever. It's just, it's just about the language because they're, everyone's saying the same thing. The indigenous people and the scientists are saying the exact same thing. They're just saying it in their own language. That's all it is. And the storytelling from indigenous wisdom is beautiful. Um, and that is something that in our society has, has lessened because our community structures are completely different. But if you had something and then you went to your mom or your dad or your auntie or your grandma and you were like, oh, this is a thing. And then they told you an old wives tale or whatever, like, oh, well, I, you know, I can't think of one. But yeah, I don't know. Ice is good for headaches or whatever, you know. And you're like, oh, how do you know that? Well, my mother told me and my teacher said this when I was younger and blah, blah, blah. We just hold on to stuff we hold on to stories right but it's like okay well how do we make science a story basically so that's kind of how i've built it is that people need to understand the science they need to because we're westernized to the point where our programming is so centered around give me the proof always that we can't just be like yeah feel feel that understand how that feels what ends up happening though which is so great is that people because they're getting it all in one session they're getting the right feel it but also do it and then also here's some science for you factual evidence like for example well, there's a muscle in your lower or well, two muscles in your lower back called the psoas muscle and that muscle is nicknamed the fight or flight muscle and it's a core part of my of my method because when you're stressed you go into brace 
And that muscle there is, it takes on all of the, all of the tension. And when that muscle is contracted, your nervous system gets stuck in fight or flight. So to relax, you need to relax that muscle. One of the best ways to relax that muscle is to like move your waist. So wind your waist, right? And so I basically am like, you need to wind your waist, but I'm gonna tell you the science. And then people are like, oh my God, like I just do this when I go out or I dance like this anyway. And then suddenly they realize like, oh yeah, that does make me feel better. Or I do it in my house or whatever. And all these little just light bulbs make people realize that everything that they do intuitively anyway, because they do, most people, I'll say even there's another point like tapping on the collarbone, right? Tapping on the collarbone is great for anxiety. Or like here, when we're stressed, we go to our temples. Like all these points are really, really great in regards to, um, yeah, just regulating the nervous system basically. And um, people go, oh, I already do that. I do that already. And I'm like, yeah, do you know why? They're like, well, now I do. And I'm like, yeah, so now you can connect those dots. So you, like you say, in the heart and the, and the doing and then also the science. Let's do an example of that, right? Because okay. I, I, I don't want to do it for myself. Okay. Okay. Um, so the tapping on the collarbone or whatever, if yeah. I come to you and I say, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling really anxious, don't know why, I'm just so stressed, work's terrible, family are annoying me, you know, my dog just won't go to sleep, yeah. I've got a puppy and it's just... I, what can I do just to get myself like, so I've only got, I've got no time in the day, but I just need something to kind of help me out at the moment just to get me through. Yeah. Like, what can you do in terms of, is there any little tips little and bits. tricks you've got? Yeah. So first thing would be go to your feet. Go to your feet. Right. Yeah. The reason being is because your feet have over 7,000 nerve endings in your feet. So when your nervous system is on high alert, and you need to regulate and you need to calm yourself down. And basically when your nervous system is in high alert and that stress response is kind of stuck, you're in fight or flight and then the other response is freeze. And freeze is the one that makes us feel literally stuck, right? Fight and flight is still active. Yeah. It's still, I need to run away or I need to fight. So the stuckness is, you don't really want to get there because that's where you feel really heavy and you're just like, oh my God, I feel hopeless. You want to kind of, when you're in that active fight or flight, which you've just described, which is everyone's driving me crazy. I want to fight everyone. Come to your feet because your feet with the, that amount of nerve endings in your feet, you're basically going to ground yourself into your body and remind your body, most importantly, that you're safe. There's nothing, you're fine. You're okay. There's no danger. So these responses are how we obviously respond to, to stress. And we all get overwhelmed, everyone does, because life can be crazy, right? But it's like, how am I responding to this, this stress? None of these people are trying to kill me. I'm okay. And that's, all, your body at all times is just trying to protect you and your mind. You, just, you are literally trying to protect yourself from death at all times. It's built into us. So the feet are your number one. Now do it when you're doing it. Just literally squeeze your feet, but put some music on. Because when you're putting music on, it's also bringing you into a sensory space, sound. So you're using touch and you're using sound. So massaging your feet. Obviously, this is a good example because you've got a bad foot. Yeah, yeah. So you can't do this to your feet, right? Oh, yeah, so you're yeah. like, well, what, am I, what are you talking about? Hands. Your fingertips are covered in nerve endings, again. So your hands and your feet, right? Simple tools. So all you've got to do is just sit there, again, with music in your ears, close your eyes and just squeeze your fingertips and just get into the rhythm of that music. And when you're doing it and you're squeezing your fingers, just notice how your body responds to you squeezing your fingertips. Because it will, it will send a response. You'll feel like tingling, you might feel warm, you might feel just like, oh, am I numb? Like, can I even feel this? And then the more you do it, you're like, no, I can feel it now. Just sit there for a minute and play with your hands and just squeeze. Because that is literally your nervous system. Your nervous system is, autonomic nervous system is broken down into two parts. You've got your motor and your sensory. Movement and senses. That's it, it's so simple. So all you gotta do is create movement and a sensory experience, and that will bring you back into your body and it will deplete that stress response from, you know, things that are not, um, they, they're not active, actual, real life stresses. There are perception to stress because- it's, it's Exactly, exactly. Because stress is important, you know, that's the other thing. Again, in a lot of wellness stuff, it's like, oh no, never be stressed. It's like, always be regulated. It's a fact of life kind of right. Like, we need it. Yeah. We, that's how we survive. If we don't have stress, we die. It's as simple as that. Because then something stressful does happen, like actual life or death, and then we, our body just whoop, don't know how to deal with it. So we need stress and we need to build that resilience. But obviously in those moments of just, it, everything just got a bit too much because you let one thing kind of maybe dysregulate you a bit and then you didn't come out of that response, you then need to go into, um, into more, 
body-based tools to bring you back down. The sim it's called somatics, somatic work um, of, yeah, feeling and sensation. Because when you can feel it, where am I holding onto this? Where is it? When you can do that, that is your life sorted. <laughs> I guess it brings you to the present, right? Like, absolutely. You're not worried about the past. No. You're not worried about the future. It brings you right into the present. Yeah. Even just through doing that, I'm yeah. like, man, I can, at first I didn't feel it. And you're just like, yeah. no, nah, actually I can really feel it. And yeah. it's like, like, it's weird. Cause now I'm thinking and I'm in the present. Exactly. I'm feeling it is a, it's a thing I it's can feel. Thing. Exactly. And this is the key. Even Eckhart Tolle even says this is like, stress is anything that brings you out of the present moment. Well, guess what's always present? Your body. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing. Your mind is not. Your mind is dangerous. It goes off everywhere else. And this is a lot of the time as well. We see this in a lot of new age spirituality and a lot of these kind of like new age things and teachings that have come in. It's just a bit like, stop telling people to go into their minds. Their minds are not the answer because the mind is, is, is it's a very warped place depending on for even just what you've read that day or what you've seen or whatever. The body is not. The body will always tell you the truth right? It will always, always tell you the truth. So that's why the methodology that I work with is body based. Like it is not about thinking about anything. It's about feeling, it's about touch, it's about movement. So these kind of things and putting them all together and applying it, it you can do this anywhere. You can do that anywhere. You do it on the train, you can do it in your house, do it right now if you want, you know, like, still, yeah, I'm still, still doing, doing it. it. <laughs> I'm not even knowing I'm doing it. Oh, what kind of magic yeah. can you put me under here, man? It's like, a spell. <laughs> it's a spell. I'm literally, it's like so cool. Oh my yeah. days, I'm doing it with, yeah. I don't even know it. It's amazing, right? And I think, like, so I practice, I practice Nietzsche and Buddhism mm -hmm. and like Shakyamuni Buddha, the original Buddha 2,500 years ago from India, he taught all these different things and the first, the first half of his life when he left the, the palace and all this stuff, he really taught about trying to get rid of desires. Yeah. And that was his thing, get rid of desires, get out of your mind. But then he realized that is a fact of life. You mm -hmm. can't, desires are a humanistic and animalistic thing. You have to have desires. Yeah. So the question is, how do you make those desires valuable for yourself? Yeah. And how do you bring it within yourself? Mm -hmm. And when he's saying those kind of things, it's like, this is exactly what you're saying is it has to be within, but we don't talk about the body enough. No. When we do talk about the body, it's usually about shaming people or it's yep. a physical appearance. Yes. It's not about, oh man, let's use this vessel to mm -hmm. support us, yep. you know, as opposed to actually, no, get in your mind, get in your mind, get in your mind, which is hard because then you're thinking about how do I get in my mind? And that's all, that's your mind thinking about that. Exactly. So you're, like, you're trying to get into that, but actually you're, it's like a, a cheat trick, really. But you're not, yeah. you're going back to the original, what the original. Abor like Aborigines will have been doing it, indigenous tribes will have been doing it for yeah. years. Just not labeling it. Cause they don't, they don't have the same egoic issues as the West. They just don't, it doesn't exist. It's just like, are we eating or not? Well, that's the really cool thing is, right? You're talking about this and it's so similar to like, with Tales to Inspire, what we do with stories is, people are going like, man, this is unique. Real life people to encourage people with their real life stories to encourage change. Mm. Well, really, stories have been part of of tribes for for millennia. Forever. Right? It's how so, we're still alive. Exactly. How do we know how to fish? How yeah. do we know how to, you know, cook? How do we know how to light a fire? It's All because of stories. Exactly. And like what you said there is connecting stories to science, connecting stories to movement, connecting... It's all about yeah. all of that. So movement, and I'm going to put stories in there. I think there yeah. must be... There's got to be a collaboration in it somehow. Oh, for but, sure. Um, that's so cool. Um, wow. So where where does this compare to your dreams as a child? Like, Ooh. is this where you wanted to be? Like, did you have oh, any man. ideas? Did you want to be in music or as, as like, where, where, where was? I wanted to be a footballer. Wow. I played football from the age of five. I was very good. It's the, like, you know when you gas yourself up a bit, mm -hmm. but that, I was very good. <laughs> I really was. I, I was so good. And it's, I wish my best friend was here because he'd be like, yeah, no, she was, she was legit. I had trials at, I played for Tottenham for many, many, many years. And then I had trials at Chelsea and Arsenal. I was captain of Middlesex County. Uh, I was a football coach, level two qualified. And then um, I broke my foot and my manager passed away, like within the same year, basically. And women's football now, it's a thing, right? It's a career, it's a whole thing. And it's so amazing to see, like it's so amazing. When I was young, to even wear the Tottenham kit, Teddy Sheridan would have to go around and get the footballers to pay like a donation for us to even have just the kit. And we played in this dump in Tottenham and there was no support. It was just, we had to pay to play, you know, it was all that kind of thing. So it was, it was a career in America, but I didn't want to go to America. You went to America. Yeah, yeah, I, did, I didn't yeah. want to go to America. Um, 
it was kind of that loose idea. It bends it like Beckham. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like that was the thing, yeah, right? Yeah. But then I was like, that was my film. I was like, oh my God, Keira Knightley went and <laughs> they went and whatever. But yeah, it was never kind of on the agenda. And I think that around that time, I went through a lot of loss uh, when I was 15, 16. So my manager passed, my dad's best friend died. And then my next door neighbor who was, he was like family, he was family. He also passed within a very short amount of time and also my granddad. So there was a lot of loss and I didn't understand emotion. Like you're not taught emotion, you're definitely not taught grief. So um, I broke my foot and I just went, nah, no, can't bothered. Like I just don't know how to do it. That's when I started getting panic attacks for the first time ever. And I got diagnosed with asthma. Then I never had asthma. There's nothing wrong with me. As in, physically, I didn't have asthma, I had anxiety. To such a degree that I would be put in hospital with it. But it was, our, it was a response to all of these events of death and fear, you know? Like, how can I be around all that death at 15 and not get scared that someone else, like, including my dad or my mom, is gonna die? So, my, I didn't have a dream at that point. It kind of just, I was, I don't know, it, I went through a bit of an identity crisis, definitely, just like, who am I? That's when I found Raven. That's when it happened. Because I, I, I was so disciplined. You know, I was training six days a week. I, I, if I wasn't at, at training, I was playing football outside my house or at other part. That's where you'd find me. I was always, always training. It was, I was so disciplined. It was my whole life. Um, and again, it's great for running a business. It's great for doing this now because there's days where I'm like, I can't be bothered to get out of bed. And it's the discipline that pulls you through because you can't always be motivated. Like it's not, it's not possible to be motivated 24 seven. It's like, it's a slog. But given what I was like as a child and knowing what it took to get to those like elite levels. Yeah, that gave me kind of a lot. Um, that I apply now. So when I was little, yeah, footballer was, was my dream, but it, it was really interesting because I also, back then, it was like, I would go play football with the boys because no, I didn't have any girls except for the ones on my team. There was no girls at my school that were like football mad like me. So I was just with the boys all the time. And on the weekends, I'd go down to power league, play at power league, and it got, I got to 14 and they banned me. I wasn't allowed to play with the boys. and that became like a whole thing where we then stuck, oh, we've got to go somewhere else then. And it was like, they're arguing, saying, she's as good as us, she's better than us. Like, get, she's fine and they just wouldn't have it. So now, obviously, as I said, everything's completely different. I was still going through these hurdles of just like, how am I ever gonna like, make it or be, a, how is this ever gonna be a thing if they won't even let me play at Power League? So I don't know, like, yeah, I think that it, like, when I was a kid, like under probably 10, footballer was a thing. Yeah. Could have easily made that happen. Got to, yeah, 14, 15, I was like, I'm delusional, it's never gonna happen. The, 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 the thing that you've talked about there that is really, really amazing, and you may not even realise it is, accessibility. Yeah. You brought that in to what you're doing yeah. now. So you're like, no, like, it might even be one of your drivers that yeah. subconsciously from back then is, this has to be accessible in, to everyone that can. Yeah get this, I'm not making money an issue, I'm not making gender an issue, age an issue, no. whatever it is, you are accessible to this because this is for you, yeah. you know? And, and I think that must be through some kind of lived experience that, of Probably. yourself, that man, I'm making sure that this is accessible to everyone. Yeah. So like, that yeah, is, Good point, never man. thought about it like that. Cause I've, I always think about it from when I was sick, like not having access to help, you know, actual help. Um, but really, yeah, it definitely goes way back further than that because their dis yeah, discrimination in general, just even as a woman, like, you know, I was very lucky that I had the boys around me when I grew up because they were my champions. Everywhere, I w like, they, they was, she's better than us, she's better than us, like, everywhere we go. Like, even now, my best friend, like, we'll meet people and everyone's like, oh, how did you guys meet? And we were like, oh, we met when we were, like, 10, 11. And he's like, she's a baller, you know. <laughs> she's a baller. She's the best I know. And like, he, that's how he introduces me. Like now, even though me and him both now work in the music industry, um, or did, or whatever, I don't know what industry I work in anymore. But yeah, both of us went on a music career thing. 
but both of us met as football coaches. So we've had this like very parallel life, which is quite cute. And then, yeah, he still though introduces me as that girl. He doesn't introduce me as Emma. Like, <laughs> that's nice. this thing well, now. That's why we can introduce her. Yeah. Emma, Emma Marshall, the baller. The baller. There you <laughs> go. I love it. That is class. So Emma, I've got some questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. Quick fire questions that I prepared. But how do people find out about you, what you're doing? Yeah, how do people get in touch? So my Instagram, which I do a lot of stuff on and like direct people to everywhere is Emma the Alchemist. Um, so you just type that in, you'll find me. And then our website is movementismedicine.uk and so is our Instagram. So yeah, those are the places that everything comes and um, our mailing list is something that you absolutely should sign up to because that's where like you'll get it straight into your inbox. So classes, events, you know, workshops, all of that kind of stuff, that's all through the mailing list. So you can find that on the website. Amazing. And we'll be, we'll be tagging everything so <laughs> straight to you, so of course. Um, so question time. Yeah. So, the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask a question. It's going to be quick fire. You've got to have an answer. No reason or no explanation. Okay. Why. okay. One word? Uh, it can be more than one word. Okay. But um, essentially it is that quick fire intention. Cool. So life is about? Living. Dance is important because? It's, it's uh, joyful. <laughs> <laughs> True education should? Uh, be accessible. Oh, I love that. Travel can bring? Um, huge growth. A truly healthy person? Is mind, body and soul. Mm, I love that. Community can bring? Health. If you were to give advice to your 21 year old self, what would that advice be? Keep going. Oh, I love that. <laughs> if you were to have a law, a government law, it's your law, the Emma Marshall law, you know, you can choose whatever you want and everyone had to do it, what would it be and why? Um, everyone has to move every day and it's like a monitored thing um, because it really genuinely will bring so much change in, to our lifestyle and our health. I love that. Yeah. How much of where you're at right now is due to luck and how much of it is due to hard work? Oh, hard work. I don't believe in luck. I love it. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Straight on it. That yeah. is so cool. Don't believe in luck. <laughs> so the last two questions Emma, that I'm going to ask everyone, but before that, I just want to say thank you. Thank like, you. And it's not even thank you for being here. Just thank you for doing what you do, mate. Like and being so unique. You are. You are very. What do you use? Eclectic is the word you yeah, used before yeah. for your music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it resonates a lot. So you're amazing. Thank you. And to having the opportunity to meet you so randomly. Yeah. On a TEDx, we were so nervous. I've never <laughs> sweated so much. I played football my whole life. I never sweated so much <laughs> as opposed to being before that talk yeah. at a TEDx. But yeah. um, man, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, so, thank you. You're awesome. And that's, you, you've got you. massive things coming your way, oh, mate. Oh, bless you. Know you. It. Thank you it's for true. having me. Of course, yeah. of course. Um, I love what you guys are doing. Man. I think it's amazing. It's, yeah, well, it's together, you know, it's about the spirit, right? Your intention yeah. and going doing it. Yeah. And realising yeah. making a mistake is actually a great learning. Oh, there's never any. You know, There's no mistakes. They're just lessons. Exactly. And yeah. it's not punishing ourselves for it. It's just yeah. like seeing that process mm -hmm. as a process. Definitely. So the last two questions that yeah. we've asked every Tales from Spire ambassador, over 150 people. Yeah. The first one is, so Emma Marshall, what is your definition of the word inspire? Inspire is to live an authentic life and lead by example so that you don't have to do anything apart from just be yourself and that should have a knock-on effect positively to those around you that are able to witness that. I love that, it's like owning yourself. It's yeah. Like, oh, it's so cool, love that. I don't think we've, out of all 150, I don't think we've ever had someone say that, that's so cool. And um, my last question that we ask every Tales from Spire ambassador is, if you were to live your greatest life, you got to 100 years old, right? Yeah. And you're looking back on your life, what is the biggest impact or proudest thing you want to have achieved during your lifetime? Um, I think the project I'm working on now, definitely Movement is Medicine, is probably a legacy project without a doubt. Like that is something that I want to make sure that people have access to forever. You know, for years to come, this work is written in, in textbooks. It's, it's taken on by the NHS. It's taken on to change certain policies within the government. It's a legacy project for sure. But family, yeah, family. Like you can do all the work in the world, but the real legacy comes from being able to create and build a, a solid family, I think. Amazing. Mm. So you've got that kind of legacy piece from a external point of view yeah. and professional, and you've got that, that family piece where yeah. you want to have a family and, yeah. and 
man that's Definitely. amazing <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the tales oh Podcast. thank you for having me on today oh. it's been really good <laughs> thank you for watching today's episode if you enjoyed today's episode then please leave a comment in the comment section below and we cannot wait to see you for our next episode